Two words, our Father. That was absolutely shocking when people heard that back then. Really? We talk to God like he's our Father? We want to address him as our Father? That implies a really close relationship, a personal relationship. Because he's not like the force on Star Wars. He's not an impersonal object. He's, he's not a distant God. He's not an angry tyrant in the sky re ready to strike you with lightning. That's not God. What kind of relationship could you have with a God like that? No, God wants you to treat him like he's your father. You can't talk to a force, but you can talk to your dad, right? You can spend time with your dad. That's what God wants with us. That's the kind of relationship he wants. That's why he describes it like he's our father. The problem is, for many people, the word father can bring up a lot of bad memories that they have of their own father. Uh, for some of you, your father wasn't someone that you wanted to be close with. Uh, your father maybe was really demanding or uh, neglectful or abusive or maybe just wasn't even around. Nobody in here had a perfect father. I don't know anybody that had a perfect father. We know that, and yet subconsciously, many times we take how our dad treated us and put that onto God. And we act like if that's how our dad treated us, that's how God treats us too. We project our earthly father's character onto our heavenly father. If our earthly father was overly demanding, then we see God as being overly demanding. He's not happy with us unless we meet all his demands. Um, if our earthly father lost his temper, we're afraid of God lashing out at us too. If our earthly father abandoned us or neglected us, it's hard to picture our heavenly father wanting a close relationship with us. So Jesus made it clear when he said in Matthew 6, 9, pray like this, our father in heaven. In other words, we're not praying to just a regular father. He's not just talking about where God is because God isn't just in heaven. He's everywhere. He's talking about the quality that God has, that he is not like us. He's not a human father. He is our heavenly father. He's perfect. He never neglects us, never abuses us, never makes too many demands of us. So when we pray, God wants us to call him our father in heaven or our heavenly father. And even though Jesus explained all this to us and we have it all in the Bible, there are still a lot of people who don't understand who God is and how to relate to him. And you can really boil it down to four common misconceptions about God. For example, some of you think that God is unreasonable. And that misbelief is keeping you from getting to know God. Because you think God is, if you get close to God, he's going to put all these crazy demands on you. He's going to make you want to, he's going to want you to do things that you just can't do. You can't live up to all these things. He's going to make your life tough with all these rules and restrictions and take away all your fun and happiness. So if you think that way, it's pretty easy to understand why you don't want to get to know God. Others of you think that God is unreliable. And the reason you think that is because you've been hurt. Many times when someone gets hurt, we blame God. Not just the person who hurt us, but we blame God for that thing. We think, God, how could you allow this to happen? Some of you here today keep God at an arm's length away because of how you've been hurt. You don't trust God. There's a bitterness in your heart toward him because of something that happened to you. Those of you who have been hurt over and over again, you get to the point where you say, I'm not going to trust anyone, especially God. God has given us incredible freedom to choose, to make choices in life. We're not robots. He could have made us robots. So we're just programmed to do things a certain way all the time. But God didn't want that. And because we have freedom, some people choose to abuse it by hurting others. Could God have taken away people's freedom so they didn't hurt you? Yes, but that would have taken away your freedom too. And you wouldn't have liked that. You know, we often think about how people hurt us, but we forget that we also hurt other people too in life. And God didn't stop you when you were hurting other people, when you were acting selfishly. Why? Because he gave you a free will. God doesn't cause hurts. We do. We cause hurts. 
We make bad choices. God gave Adam and Eve freedom. And they, and they chose to sin. And that brought all this disease and sickness and sin and evil and decay into our world. And weeds, get all these weeds and floods and tornadoes and violence and people confused about who they are and wars and corruption, all these things because of sin. God gave us freedom to make choices in life and we see the result of people's bad choices all around us, even our own. He wants you to overcome evil by choosing good. Amen? Others of you think that God is just unconcerned. It's like that song they play at Christmas time. I don't, I don't know why. I don't think it's a Christmas song. I don't even like the song. But it's so annoying. It says, God is watching us from a distance. Oh, that song just <laughs> drives me nuts. Why they got to play it everywhere I go? No, he's not watching us from a distance. He's here. He's with us, up close and personal. He's not far away looking at us through a little telescope, keeping an eye on us while he's busy doing something else. God cares about what you're going through. He cares about every detail of your life, your relationships, your job, your work, your family, everything that's going on, every need you have, he cares about it. He is with you. He's up close. The fourth misconception is that God is unpleasable. You think no matter how hard you try, God is never happy. If you got C's on your report card, well, God wanted B's. If you got B's, God wanted A's. If you got A's, God wanted A pluses. It's never enough. God never happy. Where do you think we get that idea from? We get it from how we grew up. We don't realize how much our relationship with our earthly parents affects how we view God. If you couldn't please your earthly parents, you think you can't please God. If you had to earn your parents' approval, you think I got to earn God's approval. I got to do a lot of good things so God will love me too. So today, on this Father's Day, I want to encourage you to open your mind and just take all your views about God and put them on the shelf for a moment so we can look into God's word and see what he says about who he is and the kind of father that God is and the kind of father he wants us to be too. So Lord, open our hearts and speak to us today about the kind of father you are, the kind of relationship you want to have with us and the kind of fathers you want us to be and parents that you want us to be too. In Jesus' name. Everyone says? Amen. Amen. All right, the Bible says, number one, that God is a caring father. God is compassionate and loving toward you. He cares about you. Ephesians 3.19 tells us that our brains aren't even big enough to really understand how much God loves us. We can't even comprehend it. Uh, the Bible says in Psalm 103.13 that the Lord is like a father to his children, tender and compassionate to those who fear him. God has compassion on you like a father has toward his own kids. What happened when Jesus' disciples were out fishing and Jesus fell asleep? Remember this? A storm came up and the wind and waves are getting fierce and the boat is going up and down and up and down these huge waves. And the, it seems like the boat's just going to capsize. And there's Jesus in the front of the boat having a nice nap. Now, I don't know how in the world he was able to sleep through all of that. Um, you know, there's a reason that waterbeds went out of style. He's, how do you sleep like that? But he just kept sleeping somehow, and the disciples had to shake him, wake him up, and ask him, Lord, don't you care that we're dying? Don't you care that we're all going to drown? Isn't that one of the most common questions that we have? Does God care about my problems? Doesn't he care? Doesn't he know what I'm going through? Doesn't he care about my hurts and my worries and everything going on in my life? But the Bible tells us over and over again, yes, he does. Yes. 1 Peter 5, 7 says, cast some of your anxiety on him. Right? It says, give him one or two of your cares. Give him the ones that are really sound spiritual. No, that's not what it says. Look at 1 Peter 5, 7. Give all your worries and cares to God, for he cares about you. Whatever it is, it might be big, it might be small, whatever it is, give it all to God. You have a Father in heaven who cares about every detail of your life. 
Jesus said he even knows the number of hairs on your head. Now, for some people, that's not too hard. But, God, but really, there isn't anyone who knows the exact number of hairs that you have. But God does. That's important enough to God to know. You think, well, that's not really that important, but it is to God. He knows every detail of your life. So Jesus tells us in Matthew 6, 31, don't worry about these things, saying, what will we eat? What will we drink? What will we wear? These things dominate the thoughts of unbelievers, but your heavenly Father already knows all your needs. Would you want your kid coming to you and saying, I'm, I'm worried that we're not going to have enough to eat tomorrow. I'm worried that I'm not going to have any clothes to wear. I'm worried, I don't know, what, am I gonna, what are we going to do? You wouldn't want that because you want to care for your kids. You want them to feel like you can be secure knowing that I'm taking care of you. It's going to be okay. All your needs will be taken care of. Well, God doesn't want you to worry either because he's your father. He's your heavenly father. Whenever you start to worry about anything in life, that is a warning sign that you're doubting God's love for you. You're doubting that God really is in control, that he really is going to take care of you, that he really does love you. You don't think that he can handle it. You don't think that he cares enough. You don't realize how much God loves you, and he's committed to taking care of your needs like a, a parent is for their child. And that's why we get so stressed out, isn't it? We need to see how God is a caring father. The second thing the Bible tells us about God is he's a consistent father. You can count on him. He's dependable. He never lets you down. James 1.17 says, whatever is, a good and perfect, whatever is good and perfect is a gift coming down to us from God our Father who created all the lights in the heavens. He never changes or casts a shifting shadow. Some fathers are unpredictable. You never know how are they going to be. They're going to be up or down. They're going to be uh, moody. They're going to be violent even. Uh, you don't know what to expect. An inconsistent father produces insecure kids. But God is not like that. He's never moody. He never has a bad day. When I'm feeling down, he's still up. When I'm feeling uh, just in battle and just struggling, he's always victorious. He's never had a bad day. He's never had anything go wrong. He's always in perfect control. And, and what's even better is that his consistency doesn't depend on my consistency. 2 Timothy 2.13 says, If we are unfaithful, he remains faithful, for he cannot deny who he is. Isn't that good news? Even when I'm feeling down, even when I'm struggling, when I'm not consistent, when I'm not faithful, he never changes. He's always consistent. And that's good news because our world is constantly changing. And it seems like you just can't count on things all the time. The Bible says that God will never change. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. His love and truth never change. He never throws a temper tantrum. He never loses control of himself and has to apologize. He doesn't you know, start zapping people for fun just because he's bored. You know? <laughs> he always acts in love. He always acts with grace, and he offers you his power. Malachi 3.6 says, I am the Lord, and I do not change. He never makes a promise he can't keep. One of the greatest causes of resentment and bitterness in kids is when parents don't keep their promises. They have, or anybody doesn't keep their promises. Because kids just look at it like, I thought you were going to do this. But of course, we're not perfect. But some of us can still remember things our parents said we were going to do, and it didn't happen. There's that kind of sadness, that bitterness inside. But God always keeps his promises. Romans 11.29 says, God's gifts and his call are irrevocable. I love that word. They're irrevocable. Psalm 106, 1 says, Praise the Lord. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His faithful love endures forever. Now that's the kind of consistency that you can count on. You can count on God even when all else fails. Those of you who grew up with a dad who was inconsistent or absent or abusive or just wasn't around, 
You can look to God as your father to be consistent, to have the kind of relationship that he wants with you. But it can be hard to really understand that when you grew up with a father who wasn't that way. It might be harder for you to really grasp the reality of God's unconditional love for you. And it's harder because it's going to take an extra measure of trust because you're not going to have that naturally since you didn't see it modeled for you. But the good news is because it takes an extra measure of trust, your faith is going to be really based on on your relationship with God. It's going to be based on that trust, that faith in him, not based on your feelings, not based on a question mark. It's going to be based on faith. There was a girl in Chicago who told a story of how she grew up with a dad who suffered from mental illness. One day he was just really confused and angry, and he ended up murdering her mother. And she said this, My earthly father took from me something that no one deserves to have taken when he murdered my mother. But one day I discovered that I have a heavenly father who gave to me what no one deserves to have given when he gave his son Jesus Christ on the cross for me. He gave me forgiveness and significance and peace and life. So today, trust God to be your father, the father you maybe never had. He's a father who cares for you, and he's completely consistent, completely trustworthy all the time. The third thing we learn about God is this. God is a close father. He's available for you 24-7, 365 days a year. He's always there when you need him. He's not closed due to a staffing shortage. He's not experiencing any supply chain issues with getting blessings to you. He always has enough. The Bible says in Acts 17, 27, His purpose was for the nations to seek after God and perhaps feel their way toward him and find him, though he is not far from any one of us. He's not hiding from you. He's not trying to see if maybe you'll find him. He wants you to find him. He wants to have a relationship with you. He wants to be close to you. Maybe you grew up with a father who was always too busy for you. He was always working, or he's too busy to spend time with you, just uninvolved in your life. But that's not how God is at all. Uh, A study a few years ago from the President's Council of Economic Advisors found that the rise in families where both parents are working or where there's a single parent who's, who has to work and raise the kids, it's resulted in the fact that, on average, parents spend 22 fewer hours with their kids each week than they used to in 1969. That's almost a whole day worth of attention that kids don't get anymore, on average, in our country, across all families. So it, when, you, when you think about that, is it any wonder that we're seeing all this school violence on the rise? Uh, kids who are confused about their identity and the rise of disrespect toward authority figures when they're getting so much less and less parental involvement and attention in their life. Uh, they're not having parents who are leading them spiritually, building that strong spiritual foundation. Look at the results. Life was supposed to be so much better in the future, wasn't it? Well, the future's here. And we have, yeah, we've got great technology. We've got a lot of conveniences. But what cost did it come at? Don't make the kids pay for a lifestyle that you can't afford. Love for kids is spelled time. Here are three good news truths about God. Number one, God is never too busy for me. Your parents may be too busy for you, or you may be too busy for your kids, but God is never too busy for you. He never sends you to voicemail. He never ghosts you on a text message. He's always there. He's never too busy. Psalm 145, 18 says, The Lord is close to all who call on him. Yes, to all who call on him in truth. There was a man who was working at Microsoft as the chief technology officer and was worth over $250 million, and on his way to having a lot more, a lot more. But at the age of 39, he's only 39, at the age of 39, he decided to take a year off from that job to spend more time with his twin boys who were 10 years old. And he, he just said, I've, I'm not spending enough time with my kids. I need to spend more time with my kids. So he took a year off. Can you imagine that in today's age where it's just get more, get more, get more? You may not be in the position to do that. 
you know, I, I understand. You don't have $250 million in your bank account. But there may be other lifestyle changes that you could make that would make it so you could spend more time with your kids, uh, be present with your family, because you're only going to have your kids for a limited time. And we know our lives are only limited for a short time. And nobody on their deathbed ever said, man, I regret not working more. I regret not taking more trips or not, not doing more, more work things or things on my own. It's always, I regret not spending more time with my family or not having more time with somebody. It's always the relationships because that's what matters the most, right? So we need to make time for our kids. We need to make time for our families because God makes time for us. He's never too busy for us. Number two, God loves to meet my needs. Matthew 7, 11, Jesus says, If sinful people know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father give good gifts to those who ask him? If we as human beings who tend to focus on ourselves, if we're loving and caring enough to care for our kids and meet their needs, how much more do you think our perfect heavenly father who is totally unselfish is going to meet our needs? You can trust him to meet your needs. He will certainly do it. Number three, God is sympathetic to my hurt. When you come to him in pain, he doesn't say, oh, come on, it's fine. Grow up, you know, be a big boy. He understands how you feel. He's sympathetic to how you feel. Psalm 34, 18 says, The Lord is close to the brokenhearted. He rescues those whose spirits are crushed. There's a good chance that somebody in this room had a tough week this week. There's a good chance that somebody in here is feeling brokenhearted. So right now, I encourage you to turn to God. He wants to be close to you. He wants to minister to that hurt. He wants to bind up your wounds and to rescue you when you're feeling crushed. He's never too busy for you. So you can come to him today. The word that Jesus used for father is the Aramaic word Abba. It's like our words dad, dada or papa or daddy. Those close kind of words that, you know, Abba is the first word that a child will learn in the Middle East. It's the first word that they'll learn. It's this close, intimate word that not everybody uses. It's a special word. Uh, that's the kind of relationship God wants with you. And some people, you might be uncomfortable with that. You might be uncomfortable being that close to you. You're used to having a distant relationship with God. Some people, you might hear, some people, when they pray, they use all these fancy words like they're in a Shakespearean play. And they <laughs> all these big words. And maybe that's why you're afraid to pray out loud. Because you're, I don't know how to sound like those people. I don't know how to use all those fancy words that they use. But, okay, here's the thing. I, I've never met anybody who actually talks like that all the time. Have you? I've never met anybody who actually uses Old English today. God didn't get stuck in the 1500s. He is still alive today. <laughs> he is still alive. He wants you to talk to him as your father in 2022. Not ritualistically, not with a bunch of these and thous, not with a bunch of flowery, flowery language, all these big words that you don't normally use. He wants you to talk to him like a real person, like he's really your father. Don't make it so complicated. You think you need a degree to pray to God. Anybody can pray to God. You can pray to God. You don't have to learn all these fancy words. He wants a close relationship with you, like a father, like your daddy. So God is caring. He's consistent. He's a close father. And finally, number four, God is a competent father. He is competent. He can handle any problem you have. Nothing is beyond his ability. Isn't that good news? Yes. Luke 137 says, nothing is impossible with God. When you're a kid, you think your parents are Superman. Superman and Wonder Woman, right? You think they can do anything. They can handle anything. But when you get older, you start to realize, well, actually they can't. They, they're limited. They don't know everything. They can't do everything. Um, but your Heavenly Father really can do anything. 
He is super, not man, he's super God. He can do anything. Ephesians 3.20 says, Now all glory to God who is able through his mighty, work, mighty power at work within us to accomplish infinitely more than we might ask or think. What is the biggest thing that you can imagine God doing in your life? Think about that. God can do way more than that. What is the biggest problem that you think God can handle? God can handle way more than that. Isn't that awesome? So what have you been doubting God to handle in your life? What has you stressed out right now? What situation you're, you're, you're thinking you got to help God's hand along or it's not going to happen the right way? You think, i got to cut some corners. I might have to be a little deceptive. I might have to work some extra hours or else it's not going to work out the way it should. Do you really think that God can't handle it, but you can? Do you really think that you, that you can handle something that God can't? You need to put it in God's hands and trust him because he's the only one who's actually in control in this world. He's the only one. And he will take care of his children. So that begs the question, who is a child of God? Who is God's children? Is everyone a child of God? Does God take care of everybody's needs? Well, it depends on what you mean. Did God create everybody? Yes, he created all, all of us. He's our creator. Does God love everybody? Yes, he loves everybody. He loves us all. Um, does God have a plan and a purpose for us? Yes, he has a plan and a purpose for your life. He designed you with a plan and a purpose. But it takes more than birth to be a father. It takes a relationship. Many of you, or maybe not many, but some of you don't know your biological dad. He maybe, you know, helped create you, but he's not... You know, you don't have a relationship with him, so he's really not your dad. He's not, you don't have that relationship with him. God says, I've created you, I created everybody, but not everyone is my child unless they have a relationship with me. You are not in the family of God until you choose to become a part of it. And that's a choice made available to you because of what Jesus did. John 14, verse 6, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one can come to the Father except through me. If you had really known me, you would know who my Father is. From now on, you do know him, and you have seen him. And Galatians 3, 26 says, For you are all children of God, how? Through faith in Christ Jesus. Not through being a good person. Not through going to church. Not through keeping the Ten Commandments, but not through being baptized or being confirmed. The only way you get into God's family is through faith in Jesus, period. That's it. To get into a human family, you're either born into it or you're adopted, right? That's the only way to get into a human family. Well, it's the same way with God's family. 1 Peter 1.3 says, All praise to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, it is by his great mercy that we have been born again because God raised Jesus Christ from the dead. So, yeah, you're born once into a human family, but then to become part of God's spiritual family, you've got to be born again. You've got to have that spiritual rebirth, that change in your life that only Jesus can do when you give your life to him. Ephesians 1.5 says, God decided in advance to adopt us into his own family by bringing us to himself through Jesus Christ. This is what he wanted to do, and it gave him great pleasure. When you're born again and you're adopted into God's family, it gives him good pleasure. But it's only that happening through Jesus, through faith in Jesus. He's the only way. John 1.12 says, Yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. You receive him, and you believe in him. Believing isn't enough. You can believe in God. That doesn't get you to heaven. Even the demons believe in God. You've got to receive him into your life by giving him total control of your life. Letting him in. If you haven't done this yet, what are you waiting for? It's not about a religion. That doesn't get you to heaven. It's only a relationship with God through Jesus the greatest thing that you could teach your children 
is how to know Jesus as their Lord and Savior, to know Jesus so they can be in heaven when they die. If you, if you leave that kind of spiritual legacy for your kids, that's the only thing that really matters. You might say, well, it's too late. My kids are all grown up. What do I do? They have kids of their own. It's too late. It's never too late to make a start. It's never too late. There is no hopeless soul. It's never too late for God. You need to be praying for those kids. Maybe call them up and apologize for not telling them about the most important thing in your life. Maybe say, I didn't know God when I was raising you. But I know him now and he is the caring creator. He cares about you. He's the consistent parent that I could never be. I want you to know him too. I want you to be in heaven when you die. I don't want to be there without you. Do everything you can to introduce them to their heavenly father. It's not just telling them about God, but living it out in your lifestyle. It's how you treat people. You can live to be the kind of person who causes your family to want to get to know God and not push them away. Lord, today we thank you for being the father that maybe some of us didn't have. You're the father who cares about us. You're compassionate toward us. You understand how we hurt. You're consistent toward us. Thank you, Lord, that you are that father to us. Help us, Jesus, to understand who you are more and more, to let go of all these old ways of thinking about you that aren't true, thinking that you're distant, thinking that you don't really want a relationship with us, thinking that you're too demanding. That's, all these things aren't true. You care about us. You want a close relationship with us. Help us to get to know you in that way. And help us to pass that on to our kids, to be that example, to, to share that with them. We want our kids to know you in that special way too. And we want to raise our kids in that way. We want to raise them like you are. We want to become a dad like that. And Lord, because we're imperfect, we are going to fail. Maybe... For some people, your kids are all grown up and you feel like, I, I didn't do that. I didn't raise them that way. Lord, your grace and mercy is enough to cover us, to forgive us, to help us make a new start. It's not too late. Help us, Lord, to have the wisdom. Give us the wisdom we need in what to do, how to reach out to our kids, how to establish that relationship, maybe reestablish it. Help us to be able to pass on that spiritual legacy to our kids, even if they are growing up. Lord, I pray that you'd open their hearts to hear this message. Open their hearts to know how much you love them, how much we love them. That they would come to know you. We want every, every child, every person, every part of our family to know you, to live for you, Jesus. That's the most important thing. And anyone here in this room who says, I need, a, I need Jesus in my life. I need to commit or recommit my life to Jesus. I want to pray for you too. And it's as simple as saying ABC. Admit your sins to him. Believe he is God's son. And confess your sins and, and commit your life to him. So if you'd like to do that, just pray in your heart. Express your faith to him. And say, Jesus, come into my life. I want you to be my father, my heavenly father. Adopt me into your family. I believe you are God's son. You died to pay the price for all my sins. You rose again from the dead. So now I commit my life in your hands. I commit to live for you each and every day by your help, by your power, the power of your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. And if you prayed that prayer, I want to encourage you to Talk with me or fill out the side of your bulletin on there. and Give a response so we can help you grow in your faith. And if you pray that prayer online, I want you to encourage, encourage you to reach out on the chat right now or call our church. We want to help you grow in your faith too. Let's all stand. We're going to close with this song. Talking about how God is a good father and the kind of love he has for us. And I hope that helps you to be encouraged today to live that out in your life. Happy Father's Day, everybody.